Hey everyone, welcome back. Yeah, thanks for having me. So today we're talking about a condition that can be, you know, pretty scary for patients and also tricky for us as providers. Definitely. Fournier's gangrene. Uh, it's not something you see every day, but when you do. It's a it's a real emergency. Exactly. And that's why we wanted to take some time to really break it down. Mm. You know, what are we dealing with here? So at its core, Fournier's gangrene is a necrotizing fasciitis. Meaning? It's a really aggressive bacterial infection that spreads rapidly through the soft tissues, and it can destroy those tissues really quickly. And just to be clear, we're talking about the soft tissues in a very specific area, right? Yeah, absolutely. We're talking about the perineum, the genitals, and the area around the anus. Right. And... I think there's sometimes a misconception that this is only a problem for men. Oh, definitely. But that's not true at all. Mm. Women can absolutely get Fournier's gangrene, too. In fact, what percentage of cases are we talking about? It's estimated that somewhere between 10 and 25 percent of cases occur in women. So it's definitely something to be aware of in both male and female patients. Now, another thing that makes this condition so dangerous is how quickly it can progress. Oh, absolutely. You're right. A patient might come in with what seems like a relatively minor infection, you know, a small abscess or something like that. Right. Something seemingly simple. Exactly. And then, boom, within hours or even less, the infection can spread like wildfire. And that's especially true for patients who are immunocompromised, right? Absolutely. Patients with weakened immune systems are much more vulnerable to these kinds of rapidly progressing infections. So what's happening at the cellular level that causes this kind of rapid tissue destruction? Well, one of the key processes is microthrombosis. Okay. And what exactly does that mean? So basically what happens is that tiny blood clots start forming in the small blood vessels that supply the affected tissues. And these clots cut off the blood supply, essentially. Exactly. And without yeah. a steady flow of blood, the tissues start to die, and that's what leads to gangrene. So essentially what we're dealing with here is a race against time. That's a great way to put it. The sooner we can recognize and treat Fournier's gangrene, the better the chances of saving the patient's life and limiting the amount of tissue damage. So let's talk about treatment. Mm -hmm. What are the absolute first things we need to do when we suspect Fournier's gangrene? So the first thing is aggressive fluid resuscitation. These patients are losing fluids rapidly because of the infection, so it's essential to get fluids into them as quickly as possible. Intravenous fluids, I assume. Yes, absolutely. We're talking about large volumes of 5E fluids. And while we're doing that. At the same time, we need to start broad spectrum antibiotics. Because? Because Fournier's gangrene is typically caused by a mixture of different types of bacteria. We need to cover all the bases. So gram positive, gram negative, and anaerobic coverage. Exactly. We can't wait around to do cultures and figure out exactly which bacteria are involved. Yeah. We need to hit it hard and fast with a combination of antibiotics that will target all the most likely culprits. So what are some specific antibiotics that we might use in this situation? Well, a common first-line choice is Piperacillin Tazobactam. At what dosage? Typically 3.375 to 4.5 grams intravenously every six hours. Got it. What are some other options? Another good option is imipenem, which can be given as one gram intravenously every 24 hours. Okay. And meropenem is another possibility, usually dosed at 500 milligrams to one gram intravenously every eight hours. Right. And often we'll add vancomycin to the mix as well. Yeah, vancomycin is a good choice to cover any potential methicillin-resistant staph aureus that might be lurking in there. Now, what about clindamycin? I know that's sometimes used in necrotizing fasciitis. Clindamycin is definitely worth considering. The usual dose is 600 to 900 milligrams intravenously every eight hours. And the thinking there is that. The thinking is that clindamycin might help to suppress the production of toxins by the bacteria, which could help to slow down the tissue destruction. Interesting. And finally, metronidazole. Ah, uh, yes. Good old metronidazole. It's always a good idea to include metronidazole to cover the anaerobes. The initial dose is typically one gram intravenously, followed by 500 milligrams intravenously every eight hours. Okay, so we've got the fluids going, we've started the antibiotics. What's the next critical step? The next step is surgery. We need to get a surgeon involved as soon as possible, ideally a urologist who has experience with Fournier's gangrene. And what's the goal of the surgery? The goal is to remove all of the dead and infected tissue. That's what we call debridement. So basically, we're trying to cut out the source of the infection before it can spread further. Exactly. The more aggressively we can debride the tissue, the better the chances of controlling the infection. Now, I know that hyperbaric oxygen therapy is sometimes used in cases of necrotizing fasciitis. What's the role of hyperbaric oxygen in Fournier's gangrene? 
That's a good question. Hyperbaric oxygen therapy can be a useful adjunctive therapy, Aining. meaning it can be used in addition to surgery and antibiotics, but it's not a substitute for those things. And what exactly does hyperbaric oxygen do? Well, basically, it involves putting the patient in a chamber where they breathe pure oxygen at a higher than normal pressure. And the idea is that... The idea is that this will help to deliver more oxygen to the tissues, which can promote healing and help to fight off the infection. So it's a way to boost the body's natural defenses. Yeah, exactly. But it's important to note that the evidence supporting the use of hyperbaric oxygen in Fournier's gangrene is still somewhat limited. So we wouldn't necessarily consider it a standard of care? No, not at this point. It's more of a case-by-case -case decision based on the individual patient situation. Okay, so for those of us who are seeing patients in the clinic or the emergency department, what are the key takeaways here? What do we absolutely need to remember about Fournier's gangrene? I think the most important thing is to have a high index of suspicion for this condition, especially in patients with risk factors like diabetes or a weakened immune system. So even if the initial presentation seems relatively mild. Exactly. We can't let our guard down. Early recognition is absolutely key in Fournier's gangrene because if we wait too long to start treatment, the consequences can be devastating. So we need to be thinking about Fournier's gangrene in any patient who presents with pain or swelling in the genital or perianal area, especially if they have those risk factors we talked about. Absolutely. And I think the other important takeaway is that this is a team effort. Managing Fournier's gangrene requires close collaboration between primary care physicians, emergency medicine physicians, surgeons, infectious disease specialists, and other members of the healthcare team. Right. It's not something that any one specialty can handle on their own. Exactly. We need to work together to provide these patients with the best possible care. And I think it's also important to remember that even with prompt and aggressive treatment, Fournier's gangrene can still be a very serious condition. Oh, absolutely. There's no sugarcoating it. This is a life-threatening illness, and unfortunately, not everyone survives. But I think the good news is that with early recognition and aggressive treatment, we can significantly improve a patient's chances of survival. That's a great point. I think it's also important to remember that even for patients who do survive Fournier's gangrene, they may be left with significant long-term consequences. Such as? Well, for example, they may require multiple surgeries, skin grafts, or even reconstructive surgery, and they may also experience chronic pain scarring and sexual dysfunction. So it's a condition that can have a really profound impact on a patient's life. Absolutely. And I think that's why it's so important for us as healthcare providers to be aware of this condition and to know how to recognize and treat it promptly. Well said. I think that's a great place to wrap up this discussion. Any final thoughts? Um, I, I think just to reiterate that point, you know, Fournier's gangrene is a rare condition, but it's a serious one. And it's one that we as healthcare providers need to be prepared to deal with. Thanks so much for joining us today. This was really insightful. Glad to be here, and thanks for having me. And to all of our listeners out there, thanks for tuning in. We'll see you next time. See you later. Thank you for watching. Please subscribe to our channel by clicking the subscription button. If you have any questions, feel free to leave a comment below in the comments section.